Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, now that's the new routine uh, we have to say uh, to cover the entire globe. Um, welcome to um, today's uh, IJMF uh, Spotlight uh, Seminar. Uh, we have Arazu, but I'm not going to do the introduction. That honor goes to uh, Pavlos. Pavlos, uh, take it from here and uh, please introduce our uh, distinguished speaker and we can get going. Great, thank you, Bala. And thank you all for, for joining and attending this seminar. This is truly a, a great pleasure and uh, an honor to introduce my colleague, uh, Arezu Ardekani. Arezu uh, actually is in mechanical engineering at Purdue University and he uh, was before COVID, now we're all working from home. Uh, my next door neighbor. So every time I had a question, I would just stick my head in her office and. Uh, have a great discussion with her about a wide range of topics. Um, as you may have read in uh, her short bio, uh, Arzu has actually been uh, distinguished in many different ways. I'm not going to cover everything. Uh, I will start by saying some that it's not in her bio, that it is one of the best colleagues and collaborators one can have. And I've been very fortunate for that. Uh, but uh, going into some of her accomplishments, uh, Arezu has been the recipient of uh, NSF Career and the NSF Presidential Career Award, the PKs, uh, has been uh, recognized for her outstanding work as a graduate student mentor and an, an early career award from our College of Engineering as a, um, uh, for excellence um, in research and many, many other awards across numerous other societies, um, including um, uh, many distinctions uh, from invited publications and journals. She's a prolific scholar. She has published uh, over 100, I think 110 journal papers, all in uh, high impact, highly recognized uh, uh, journals in our field. And her research actually has covered a wide range of applications um, and topics. Um, with that, I will um, um, stop the, the introduction and pass on the floor uh, to Arzu uh, for her uh, current uh, uh, talk. Unfortunately, I cannot attend to the duration of the talk. I will have to jump out, but Bala will uh, moderate uh, the discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, Arzu, thank you for doing this and the floor is yours. Thank you, Pablo, for the nice introduction. And I indeed cherish our collaborations over the uh, several last few years. Um, let me share my screen. Are you able to see the screen? Uh, yes, Arasu. Yes, Great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about hydrodynamics mediated trapping of microbes. Um, but before I get started, I would like to acknowledge um, the role of those students um, and postdocs who have contributed to what I'm going to present today. Most of what I'm going to present today had been done by um, Nikhil Desai and Vasim Sheikh, who are students in my group and are now postdocs at Ecole Polytechnic France and University of British Columbia, as well as by uh, Rishabh Moore and Rajat Dandekar and Gao Jun Li, who uh, was a student in my group and is now assistant professor at Shanghai Jiao Tang University. So the motivation uh, for what I'm going to present is uh, from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill um, that happened in 2010 and 4 million barrels of um, crude oil was released into the Gulf of Mexico and microbes were our first respondents. Uh, and if uh, those microbial bloom were not right after the uh, oil spill, the catastrophe would have been far worse. What I'm going to talk about is that how hydrodynamic interaction between those um, oil droplets as well as silver components of oils with those microbes play a role. In fact, in the aftermath of uh, oil spill, seven million liters of dispersants were also used with the hope of uh, reducing the impact of the oil spill and increasing bioremediation by reducing the size of the droplets and increasing the surface area. Uh, so this uh, schematic from uh, our uh, cover image of the uh, paper shows uh, some of the catastrophe, some aspects of the catastrophe. And here, what I'm going to talk about is that how hydrodynamic interaction between these uh, microbes and, oil, uh, and uh, liquid liquid interfaces and air liquid interfaces play a role. Uh, so if you think about life at low Reynolds number, most microorganisms are um, very small and consequently inertial effects can be neglected compared to uh, their viscous effects. 
And there are also a number of other processes that uh, affect their life and dynamics, including the external background flow. They live in turbulent environment and their uh, background flows. They're also living in uh, the world that has patchiness and uh, gradients and nutrients that drives their dynamics and uh, distribution. When they get close to surfaces or interfaces, they form biofilm. And if you think about some of the plankton that have small and have larger sizes on the scale of centimeter, and then inertial effect becomes important, we cannot neglect it any longer. So I'm going to touch on some of the aspects that we uh, are showing in this cartoon. Um, these microbes, for example, bacteria, um, can have single or multiple flagella that are attached to their cell body um, through a motor. Um, this motor has a stator and rotor. And um, if you look at it, it looks actually very much like a mechanical motor. Uh, for bacteria, that uh, these motors can uh, reverse its direction of motion. And uh, for bacteria that have multiple flagella that can lead, like E. coli, that can lead to formation of bundle of flagella. And once in a while, these motors reverse the other reverses its uh, rotation and leads to tumbling. And we'll talk about some of those aspects later on in the talk. Um, the life at Lorena's number was um, studied in a seminal work by uh, Parcel, um, and I didn't know actually Parcel uh, was, uh, did his undergrad at Purdue before I moved to Purdue, uh, and later uh, he moved to Harvard to do his um, PhD in physics, and he received his uh, Nobel in, in physics um, for his work on NMR. Uh, so what he states is that time doesn't matter and the pattern of motion is the same, whether slow or fast, uh, whether uh, forward or backward in time. And this is referred to as the scallop theorem. Um, if you think about a scallop, it um, moves in uh, water because it's it can open and uh, close its shell at different rate. And because of the inertial effect that uh, time irreversibility in motion leads to its propulsion. But if you think about, if put it in uh, corn syrup or very uh, viscous medium, as shown in this uh, video by uh, Taylor, uh, even though this uh, flapper, which is a mimic of a scallop, can move uh, in water, it cannot propel itself in very viscous medium. And um, microbes, of course, um, know this uh, role of physics and they break symmetry somehow, for example, by having helical flagella um, and um, being able to move forward because there is no there's a four after asymmetry and it leads to their propulsion. So because the governing equations are spokes and linear, then um, one way to look at a motion of these uh, microbes uh, is to look at superposition of point force singularities that are solution to the Stokes equations. Um, if you think about a settling a sphere, a far field solution of a settling sphere can be modeled as a, a point force singularity. Um, for a swimming organism, the trust is generated um, by the flagella and drag acting on its subbody, and this equal and opposite force can be modeled with a force dipole. Their finite size can be captured by a source dipole, and uh, asymmetric propulsion can be captured by a force quadrupole. If you think about a helical flagella that is rotating, um, then this equal and opposite torque that is acting onto the flagella and cell body can be captured using rotlet dipole. Uh, superposition of all of these um, point for similarities, which have each have their own flow field, can be used to look at different uh, physics for these um, swimming microbes. So I'll start by a simplified model of a microbe interacting with surfactant laden droplet to understand the role of hydrodynamics um, on this uh, interaction between uh, microbes and um, surfactant laden droplets. So droplets here uh, for this portion of the talk is modeled as a sphere and a bacteria is modeled as a force dipole, where dipole strength is dependent on the trust that is generated by bacteria. Force dipole um, is a good model for a swimming E. coli. For example, this experiment by Angolstein and coworkers show that the flow field is very well captured by force um, dipole. Now, if we have the image singularity that is needed to satisfy all the boundary condition uh, on the surface of this drop, then we would be able to calculate the hydrodynamics induced velocity and angular velocity. And from that, knowing the swimming velocity of the microbe, we would be able to update its position as well as orientation here shown with, with P. Um, but the solution for such a um, problem uh, was absent in literature. So first we needed to find the solution for a point for singularity outside of surfactant laden droplet. So uh, this work was done by uh, Vassin, where basically we uh, find the image singularity that is needed to satisfy all the boundary conditions, including zero normal velocity on the surface, on tangential uh, continuity of tangential velocity, 
And we also have a jump in bulk shear stress that is balanced by Maragonia stress and interfacial shear stress. Then for these surfactants, they follow surfactant transport equation when there is convection and um, diffusion of these um, surfactants. And in general, surfactants can uh, uh, be transported into the interface and out of it. But for the purpose of what we are presenting, we assume we have insoluble surfactants. I won't go through the detail of the derivation for this point uh, for singularity. It's, uh, it, it's a long derivation, but the detail is given in these papers if you are interested. What we will do here is use those solutions to be able to understand trajectory and dynamics of these swimmers. So in order to do that, we use facts and law. And from facts and law, and knowing that these swimmers are force-free and torque-free, we can find the hydrodynamic induced velocity at the, and angular velocity at the location of the swimmer, which depends on the um, flow field caused by these image similarities. And then the cross product of this um, stress generated by the swimmer with dipole strength and the strain rate um, also uh, gives us the angular velocity and the aspect ratio plays a role here as well. So let's see how the results uh, would look like if we have a, a swimmer or a microbe near a droplet, for small droplets, um, these microbes get scattered, whereas if you have a large droplet, it gets trapped around the droplet. And this is all caused um, by hydrodynamics interaction between these uh, droplets and microbes. Um, in fact, if you look at the phase of space, um, distance um, versus uh, angle around the swimmer, distance of the swimmer from the surface of the droplet and its orientation, we see no fixed points if droplets are small, but for larger droplets than a critical trapping radius, we see a saddle point. So in subspace, uh, some region in the face of space, we have microbes that trap around the droplet and in the rest of the domain, they would escape. So this critical trapping radius depends on um, um, one parameter that is very important and it's dipole strength. The dipole strength is the trust generated by the bacteria, by the flagella normalized by the viscous force. And this um, trapping radius reduces with inverse of dipole strength square. And it gets a smaller and smaller as we go from bubble to oil to rigid sphere as we increase um, viscosity ratio here shown with lambda. And um, this is the case for a clean droplet. So as we increase viscosity ratio, we have a stronger and a stronger hydrodynamic interaction. But if you look at the uh, surfactant laden droplet, we see that this uh, critical radius goes down for surfactants. Um, because the hydrodynamic interaction becomes stronger, but it's even below the case of a rigid sphere. And this is non intuitive to have surfactant laden interface that has more hydrodynamic interaction than rigid sphere, but we'll talk about where it comes uh, from. And this is consistent from, uh, with the results we get for the trapping time. So if we calculate probability distribution function for the trapping time, we see it's the lowest for the bubble. Um, then for oil droplet, it gets larger. If you add surfactant, it gets even larger. But for surfactant-laden bubble, this trapping time is the largest. Um, so the fact of viscosity ratio is basically opposite when we are thinking about clean droplets versus surfactant-laden droplets. Uh, so this is coming from the fact that flow field around spherical surfaces can be written as a sum of surface solenoid uh, field and surface irrotational flow. So if you have a droplet that has interfacial viscosity of zero, then this flow field is uh, written in terms of surface solenoid field plus solid uh, particle, which is surface irrotational field. The first one is the same as clean droplet. So now if you have surfactant and non-zero interfacial viscosity, for the case that point for singularity is normal to the surface, um, the surface solenoid field disappears and the solution is the same as solid particle. So what this does is that when we increase viscosity ratio for clean droplet, um, basically normal velocity, tangential velocity and angular velocity of the microbe all increase and that leads to less trapping. Whereas as we increase, <coughs> As we increase viscosity ratio for surfactant laden droplet, we see that normal velocity is unchanged, but tangential, drop, uh, tangential velocity increases and angular velocity goes down. And this leads to uh, less trapping. So that's the reason the effect is opposite. So this um, role of surfactant is also shown here when we look at now distribution of um, these bacteria, but including also rot rotary diffusion because of the run and tumble. So, for cases when um, droplet size is uh, above the critical trapping radius, 
you see some of the microbes trapped, some escape. That's because of the rotary diffusion, which leads to escape of microbes. But as we add surfactant, we see most of them are trapped um, near the droplets, and surfactant increases the uh, trapping time. We wanted to test these effects experimentally, so we did experiments for Pseudomonas putida, which is a motile bacteria degrading um, hydrocarbons, as well as looking at E. coli. So the uh, setup is like we have bacteria in a suspension, a su suspension of bacteria in culture media. And the bottom is confined by a cover slip, and on the top it's confined by a liquid liquid or air or gas liquid interface. And we look at distribution of these um, microorganisms or bacteria. This is also relevant to other microorganisms like um, Tetrahymena, that is a, a microorganism uh, living at air water interface, as well as Pseudomonas diarogenisa, which is a bacteria causing um, lung disease and also colonizes at the interface. So the way these experiments are done is um, uh, using um, inverted microscope and visualizing uh, bacteria at different uh, plane away from these uh, solid surface as well as gas liquid surface. So these are different planes shown um, at different proximity to these interfaces. And we count number of bacteria. And from that, we can get probability distribution function um, for these bacterial distribution. So you see here, there is a peak near the uh, solid surface. And um, this had been reported uh, in the past for bacteria near solid surface. But here what we see is that near gas liquid interface, we have a larger peak in the distribution of bacteria. This is CO2 um, liquid interface. Uh, for air liquid interface, um, we uh, don't basically report the data because we do have larger peak as well, but the, re the reason for that is um, taxes toward uh, more oxygen. Whereas for CO2, we don't have such effects. So everything we see here is due to hydrodynamics effect. So this is non-intuitive results, but consistent with what I described earlier from our theoretical uh, prediction. So we looked at a number of different uh, interfaces, CO2 interface, um, dodecane, mineral oil, soybean, and for all of these, um, we basically look at probability distribution function for bacteria. For larger viscosity ratios above one, we see that these different PDFs follow the same behavior. Um, and they, uh, they are the same as what we predict from our theory. Basically, what uh, the theory shows is also when we have viscosity ratio that is large, the rotation rate of bacteria in your interface is independent of viscosity ratio. Because we include uh, other singularities like rotlet, we are able to also capture this, singular, this uh, rotation or circular motion of bacteria in your interface as well. And the theory and experiments follow the same behavior. We later use this theory to look at thin films and look at distribution of microbes uh, in thin films that are confined with liquid, liquid interface on the bottom and air liquid interface on the top. So what we see that suspensions of um, pullers are accumulated near interface, pullers generated trust in front of their um, body. And this accumulation is a stronger than suspension of pushers that generate trust behind their body. And what is interesting, we see that short flagellated bacteria are accumulated near air liquid interface, whereas long flagellated bacteria accumulate near liquid liquid interface. We have not tested um, this experimentally, but this is um, doable because we have bacteria in wide range of uh, geometries, um, long and short flagella, and that can be um, tested. What I discussed here was looking at hydrodynamics effects, but bacteria also show chemotaxis. They sense and direct uh, have direct movement in response to chemical gradient. So for example, for E. coli, they can have multiple flagella. And uh, when the motors are rotating in one direction, they form flagella bundle. Um, they move straight, but once in a while, one of these motors rotate the other direction, they unbundle and uh, go to a different trajectory, different um, orientation. And the runtime and tumble time depends on the concentration uh, gradients uh, for the nutrients. So the phenomena that I discussed uh, so far, hydrodynamics is a short uh, range effect in the sense that it's valid only a few um, um, body length away from the droplet, whereas chemotaxis can bring bacteria from far away to the nutrient source. So if we add chemotaxis on top of hydrodynamics, we see, of course, a stronger chemotaxis leads to more accumulation near the drops. But what is interesting is that still the role of hydrodynamics, which is shown here with dapple strength, is very strong. So this is shown here by trapping time normalized by the 
simulation time. So this trapping fraction basically significantly increases as we increase um, diaphylus strain. So even though chemotaxis is essential in um, governing the interaction between microbes and, and uh, droplets, but hydrodynamics role cannot be neglected. And this becomes relevant also when we look at soluble components of um, uh, oil as well. Uh, so this acts as nutrient uh, distribution around these uh, oil droplets. And um, if we calculate the average nutrient uh, exposure around these droplets, we see that non-chemotactic non bacteria are not much affected but the one that are chemotactic can have um, much more increase in their um, average nutrient exposure. So basically um, the con average concentration that they're exposed to during their um, travel uh, near nutrient source. So this is because chemotaxis brings them close to the droplets and when they get close to the basin of attraction of hydrodynamics, um, then uh, hydrodynamics kicks in and then uh, it leads to the trapping near the droplets. Um, we already touched on soluble components of the oil. For example, methane is an example of that. So the question is now how motile and non-motile bacteria consume these soluble components. Um, is it a different rate? Does chemotaxis help? And how hydrodynamic interaction affects these processes? So in order to look at that, we look at these rising motion of droplets uh, in a field that has some patchiness in the distribution of um, methane uh, or any other soluble component of the oil. And then we also include chemotaxis of these bacteria, so they swim toward region of higher concentration. The questions we want to answer as they are interacting with these rising motion of oil droplets is that does chemotaxis benefit motile bacteria over non-motile ones? What factors dictate this benefit, if there is any, and what is the extent of this benefit? So we solved this problem computationally, looking at um, uh, solving for continuity equation and uh, conservation of momentum. Here we have surface tension force um, to capture the interface of droplets. And this is done using front tracking method. And uh, so we solve for a convection diffusion equation for um, methane. Um, and the sink term here are coming from bioremediation caused by motile bacteria shown with M and non-motile bacteria shown with NM. Then we need to solve for a convection diffusion equation for a distribution of these um, bacteria. For motile bacteria, we have the chemotaxis bias. They're swimming around with velocity Vs, and they can uh, be some diffusion present because of the run and tumble effect. And for non-motile bacteria, they basically act as a flow tracer. And then these bacteria can, get, uh, can reorient. They are not spherical, so we need to include their aspect ratio. And their um, reorientation rate depends on the rotation due to ambient vorticity caused by these pseudo turbulence because of rising motion of these droplets, and also because of this uh, their chemotactic, chemotactic reorientation, uh, which is uh, related to this gradient of concentration. So here is a region of high concentration methane. Um, um, this patch of high concentration methane uh, will get mixed as this rising motion of droplets occurs. And, um, the, but there are still some regions of high gradients uh, in concentration of methane, and that drives patchiness and distribution of motile um, uh, bacteria. And we see the same places where we see large concentration gradients, uh, large uh, consumption rate by motile bacteria, but that's not the case much for non-motile bacteria because they act as flow tracer and their uh, trajectory and dynamics is not governed by chemotaxis. We define motility benefit, which is the consumption rate by motile bacteria and non-motile bacteria. We can get difference of this uh, consumption rate. And um, we look at some of these uh, uh, parameters that affect this motility benefit. I highlight only a couple here in this talk. Uh, one is droplet size to see how that affects the motility benefit. We see that as we make the droplets smaller, um, we have larger motility benefit because we are looking at a constant volume fraction. So a smaller droplet correspond to larger volume fraction. And that leads to uh, government creating um, regions of sharper gradients and the distances that are traversed by these motile microorganisms to reach their nutrient rich environment gets shorter. And that's why we see larger motility benefit. And um, this distance is also shown here. We see it increases with, uh, with time because we get more and more mix mixing in time and consequently they need to travel longer distance to get to these um, sharp gradients in concentration. 
Uh, another parameter that is important is swimming speed um, because um, the distribution of these bacteria depends on their swimming speed and the faster they go, they have also a stronger um, uh, chemotaxis effect. So motility benefit linearly increases with this um, swimming speed. And the reorientation rate that this bacteria have to sense this gradient of concentration also leads to increase in um, motility benefit, but it saturates, it doesn't linearly increase um, with, motility, with um, reorientation rate. For the next uh, few slides, I'm going to switch gears and talk about different uh, hydrodynamic interaction and different physics that lead to hydrodynamic interaction of these um, microbes with the surrounding environment in oceans and lakes. And that's governed by density um, gradients. Density gradients in oceans and lakes can be caused by either variation in temperature or salinity. And these regions of sharp um, density gradient are referred to as pycnoclines. Um, it has been reported that large concentration of marine snow particles or planktonic organisms are found at these pycnoclines. Even some species of krill uh, or dinoflagellates cannot swim through uh, thermoclines or holoclines. Even at this larger scale, if you think about planktons, um, their bloom formation is correlated with seasonal stratification. And these um, phytoplankton bloom. Um, the phytoplankton consume CO2, so when they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean. So it's a natural way of carbon sequestration, and it leads um, to it's called um, biological pump. But they can be also toxic and um, lead to disruption of water uh, supply system. And as we have enhanced in stratification because of the climate change, more and more form. Um, this uh, image is from um, Baron and Darling in Australia, but. Um, more recently, there were uh, algal bloom forming in Lake Erie near Toledo and disrupted water supply. So if you think about these organisms, um, bacteria, plankton, even larger organisms like uh, zooplankton, um, the question is that how their length of scale compare against a stratification length of scale. There is one length of scale in the problem, which is the length of scale over which density changes, and that's on the order of meters. So if you look at that length of scale, we may say, okay, they're not much affected. But what we have shown is that there is another length of scale related to viscosity, diffusivity, strength of stratification, and gravitational acceleration. And using that length of scale, even uh, organism with length of about 600 micrometer will be affected by a stratification. So in order to understand the fact, we started with the same procedure that I talked about earlier, looking at point for similarities, but now looking at how a stratification modifies these point for similarities. For a settling sphere, we have a point for similarity and we see stratification generates these toroidal eddies. And um, stratification suppresses vertical motion of fluids. So if, if you think about qualitative this is similar, this is similar, uh, similar to a point for similarity between um, two walls. And in that case, we also see these toroidal eddies. For a force dipole, um, we also see these toroidal eddies that form. And this force dipole would be a far field solution for a, for a bacteria. The velocity field also decays more rapidly in a stratified fluid. This is a velocity caused by stratification, normalized by the one in homogeneous fluid, and decays that rapidly. And this can affect the mechano sensing because many of organisms, um, plankton and zooplankton, detect a predator or prey using mechano sensing, like this uh, copepod has this large antenna, and the flexion of this antenna can detect flow disturbances in the fluid. So, if we quantify this detection volume of these organisms as the volume inside which flow disturbances exceed the threshold, uh, we see that it scales with the size of organism over this stratification length of scale, to the power minus three. So it's relevant to Rayleigh number. So if you think about 600 uh, micrometer prey, then its detection volume is reduced by 50%. So predator prey interaction can be affected. But these organisms not only also mix fluid, uh, not only they overcome viscosification to swim, but also mix a fluid around them. And consequently, their energy that is expanded by these swimming organisms increases in a stratified fluid. And that scales very similarly with Rayleigh number as well. So these are experiments showing different uh, organisms with different pixels uh, like zooplankton and other organisms that are homogeneously distributed in homogeneous fluid. But for salty fluid where fresh water is added to the top, they go to the interface. And this is not because of salt gradient, it's because of density gradient. The author actually added more sugar to the top to get uniform density, but it's still having salt gradient and the distribution um, goes back to homogeneous distribution. 
They looked at heterosigma uh, Kashiva, which is algae causing red tide uh, in salty water and added fresh water, and they accumulated near the interface as well. So these are relevant, especially in the context of um, climate change, because uh, stratification has in, enhanced because of the climate change, and that leads to reducing the portion of oxygen circulating below mixing layer. So we have larger bandwidths of microorganisms above uh, in a mixing layer, in a mixed layer, but below that um, we get a less and less oxygen because of um, this enhanced stratification. So ocean is losing its breath. Some region of um, uh, some regions have lost 40% of oxygen. Volume of water containing zero oxygen has more than quadrupled. But there are different reasons causing it. One is solubility because water gets warmer, and um, it holds less dissolved oxygen. The stratification is another reason that I talked about. And the metabolic rate of these organisms also increases by 30 to 50% when um, the temperature goes up by two to three percent. So that leads to generating large scale ocean hypoxia. So we hear, we hear a lot about global warming, but um, if we think about um, climate change, we need to talk about all three pillars, ocean acidification, ocean deoxygenation, and global warming all together to understand the entire process. So if you want to look at such a problem though, uh, uh, it it's, uh, has very rich physics. So in order to explain this physics, let me start with a simpler problem first, and then we add the fact of stratification. So let me start with the OCIN problem that all of us studying fluid dynamics are familiar with. So if you want to look at the drag of a sphere um, or, or an object in, um, in a viscous medium, but include the fact of inertia, then we see that um, we have a length of scale, which is called OCIN length of scale, which is one over Reynolds number. And inside this length of scale, uh, close to the surface, close to the object, viscous effects are dominant. But as we go outside the ocean length of scale, inertial effect uh, balances viscous effects. And um, so we need to consider this length of scale when we study um, the enhanced drag or, or a modified drag of object in um, weakly inertial effect. And now in the case of um, stratification, we have an additional length of scale, which I talked about this is stratification length of scale. So very close to the object, we have viscous effects that are dominant outside the stratification length of scale, viscous effects balances um, buoyancy effect. And outside the OC length of scale, we have inertia balancing viscous effects. So this is stratification length of scale is the length of scale of the um, buoyancy effect when Peclet numbers are small, when Peclet number is large, um, it actually changes and finds another form, which is size of the object over Richardson number to the power one third. And Richardson number itself is a dimensionless parameter that is the ratio of buoyancy to viscous effects. So now similar to OCIN problem, we need to use um, perturb a similar perturbation method to understand how a stratification modifies the dynamics um, of objects or swimmers in a stratified fluids. So we use a singular perturbation method where this parameter epsilon is the length of the object over stratification length of scale. So in the inner zone, we have only viscous effects that are important. And in the outer zone, we, we add this point for similarity and to solve for the problem. But then we need to basically match the inner solution and outer solution and find um, the role of a stratification. So there are three scenarios that we need to separately understand um, and, and discuss. One is when buoyancy uh, balances viscous effects and density is governed by diffusion. When buoyancy balances viscosity and density is governed by advection. And when inertia balances viscous effects. And that's when stratification length of scale is larger than OCN length of scale. So once we look at each of these scenarios separately and um, rescale the variables um, uh, based on the small parameters we have and on neglecting nonlinear effects and solve for the singular perturbation method, we can actually find the enhanced drag. So if you have a rigid sphere, this is how the enhanced drag looks like. The parameter F is actually um, long, so I'm not uh, reporting it here. But for droplets also behaves very similarly, except that we have this uh, term R, which is um, the role of viscosity ratio. You saw actually the exact same term when earlier we were talking about interaction of microbes with, with, with droplets over which captures the role of viscosity ratio. So the solution would be the same as bubble when uh, viscosity ratio is zero and the same as rigid sphere when it's infinity. This enhanced drag um, again follows the same uh, three behaviors. Uh, if you think about the case where 
um, this stratification length scale over OSIN length scale is very large. That's when inertia balances viscous effects and um, this stratification enhanced drag actually becomes proportional to Reynolds number, the same as OSIN length scale. But this solution that we are talking about here is valid when we have weak stratification. If we have strong stratification, we need to look at the problem numerically. This is um, a sphere in a, in a stratified fluid, uh, which generates this jet behind the sphere in the stratified fluid, whereas in homogeneous fluid, we have downward flow um, behind this sphere. In a stratified fluid, we see even formation of these Lee waves um, behind these um, spheres. Now, stratification um, leads to some um, interesting effects also when we look at interacting spheres. For example, for uh, uh, two spheres in tandem, we see drafting, kissing, and tumbling in homogeneous fluid, but in a stratified fluid, we see tumbling is suppressed. Uh, we call it drafting, kissing, separation. Um, for homogeneous fluid particles in uh, side by side, we see them moving away from each other because the vorticity is blocked by the presence of the other sphere. But in a stratified fluid, we see even though initially they move away from each other, eventually they move closer and, and move as a single object. Um, now looking at suspension of particles or drops, this slide is related to drops. We see um, similarly stratification affects their uh, hydrodynamic interaction in the sense that their uh, rising motion, these are lighter than background fluid, is a slowed down, but also as we increase the stratification um, or reduce fruit number, which is the ratio of inertial force to buoyancy force, we see they are not only slowed down, but also uh, less dispersed and more uh, clustered. Their cluster formation uh, can be also uh, analyzed using um, paracorrelation function, which I talk about in the next slide. But for now, if we look at the Reynolds number of single droplet and suspension of droplets, we see stratification slows them down. Um, this, Stratification has a stronger effect for suspension of drops compared to single drops, and velocity fluctuations are significantly um, reduced when we um, add the stratification. The microstructure of suspension is affected, and if you look at the probability uh, pair probability distribution function, we see there is peak for nearly touching droplets, but the peak gets larger as we increase uh, stratification. And uh, looking at the angular distribution, also there's a peak for 90 degree corresponding to horizontal clustering, which forms in suspension of drops, but the peak gets larger as we increase the stratification. Uh, so stratification leads to um, more accumulation of droplets and, and particles and uh, enhanced clustering. Density um, stratification, um, when we look at objects like spheres or cylinders or, or microorganisms, they can also mix fluid around them. So for example, here we are looking at a single sphere in a stratified fluid. Here is a suspension of uh, 28 spheres and here is 56. We see a very, very clearly the wake um, behind these spheres. Um, we see these um, volume of fluid that is basically trapped, trapped around these uh, spheres and goes from region of low density to high density. And this oscillation is caused basically um, because of the um, stratification itself is uh, correlated to brunt basal frequency, which is the frequency of a fluid element being dis uh, displaced from its neutrally buoyant level. So this uh, drift is a mechanism leading to mixing for these suspensions. But when we look at uh, cylinders, um, the change in potential energy that is caused by uh, settling of uh, cylinders is more governed by um, uh, the vortex shedding that occurs for, for cylinders, uh, whereas we have less of that for, for spheres. Um, I would like to go back talking about the, con the swimming dynamics um, as we, that has been the theme of the talk, um, but understand how stratification can modify um, swimming dynamics. So for this, we use a model swimmer called the squimmer, which is a model for ciliates. Um, some of the ciliates are shown here in, in this figure where they're um, cilia are covering the surface of these organisms and the metaconal beating of cilia leads to their propulsion. We want to see how stratification modifies um, their, their swimming dynamics. So this squirmer model basically assumes we have a, a slip velocity on the surface of the swimmer. And by um, playing with this slip velocity, we can get basically pullers that generate thrust um, in front of the cell and pushers that generate thrust behind the cell. 
the, the flow field generated by pushers and pullers are shown here where pullers are basically bringing fluid from uh, front and back and expels it from the side and pushers do the opposite. This model had been shown in the, uh, and used uh, widely in the literature to look at either swimming speed, nutrient uptake, interaction of the swimmers, mixing by the swimmers, as well as uh, looking at um, the effect of inertia and stratification, which is what I'm going to talk about here. So what we see is that the strat uh, these pullers and pushers in weekly, in, uh, weekly stratified fluid or in inertial regime um, behave very differently. Um, the pullers um, in inertial regime or weekly stratified fluid becomes unstable, whereas pushers are stable. And as we add the strength of stratification, we see exactly opposite behavior. The reason for this is that if you look at the puller that is moving uh, on a straight line in a weekly stratified fluid, it's bringing fluid from front and back and then expels it from the side. So if you look at the inertial effect and um, having a, a memory of remember basically the flow field from a uh, previous time, uh, time um, step, you would see that this flow field that it generates pushes it away from this straight line and consequently becomes unstable. Whereas for pusher, that is um, generating um, the flow that is coming from side and expels it from top and, uh, front and back, it brings back the swimmer to the straight line. So it becomes a stable. Now, if you think about the effect of stratification, it is exactly opposite in the sense that the flow field caused by the stratification and deflection of isopycnols, it generates the opposite flow field and makes the pullers um, stable when we look at the strong stratification. And um, this is what we are seeing in these videos as well. But as it back to a mixing that is caused by swimmers well, and I'll talk about it in the next slide, uh, but here I show the um, phase space. Uh, in this phase space on the top uh, region of the plot, we are looking at pushers. In the bottom, we are looking at pullers. And this color code is um, showing the strength of stratification as we go from the outer circle, uh, which is for homogeneous fluid to inner circle. We see, uh, we look at the strong stratification. And on the vertical line, we're looking at um, very small inertial effect on the horizontal line, very large inertial effect. So in the outer ring, we have very strong, um, uh, we have um, very weak stratification. And for pullers, we have, um, on a stable behavior, which we saw in the previous slide. And for pusher, we have on a stable behavior uh, for very strong stratification. This affects mixing of these swimmers. Um, for weekly stratified fluid, for example, um, we see these pullers undergoing helical trajectory and pushers undergoing more straight trajectory, so consequently causing more mixing. This is also clear when we look at two um, swimmers interacting. Um, this is for swimmers in weekly stratified uh, fluid inertial regime where we see them undergoing this um, circular regime uh, for pullers and undergoing uh, straight more straight trajectories uh, when we look at pushers. So this has consequences uh, for life of these uh, organisms. Um, these were the dimensionless parameter we discussed that plays their uh, important role. Uh, for pullers, we saw them for weak stratification going um, basically uh, straight, whereas for uh, pushers, uh, the same thing happens for uh, weakly stratified, stratified fluid, and the behavior is opposite when we look at a strong stratification uh, we see pushers become unstable and that can lead to trapping of these at um, phytoplankton layers. So the questions that we answered here is that combined effects of inertia and stratification, how they affect um, the swimming speed and stability. So stratification stabilizes inertial pullers while it destabilizes inertial pushers. We talked about effective stratification on swimmer in interactions and showed that stratification can increase contact time and talking about mechanisms behind the accumulation of organisms in horizontal um, layers, which um, can be the fact that they, um, these change in stability causing the trapping and uh, leading to uh, different dynamics um, and circular motion when we look at collider, colliding um, swimmers. Um, for the next couple of slides, I talk about some of the other work that we have done that are related to the theme of today's talk, which is trapping of um, microbes and hydrodynamics effects. We looked at how flow affects 
distribution of microorganisms and um, in these, for example, microfluidic devices, these vertical flow that are present can lead to patchiness and distribution of microbes and even leading to formation of um, biofilm streamers. We look at how fluid elasticity or non newtonian nature of the background fluid interact with these um, swimmers and in the presence of flow that leads to uh, emergence of limit cycle and uh, lead to patchiness to their distribution and um, uh, concentration of microorganisms. We look at the sperm showing that in um, poisonal flow, they migrate towards center line because of hydrodynamics effect. In uh, extensional flow, they can undergo buckling and um, the computation results and experiments uh, capture the same thing in terms of uh, buckling dynamics. Looking at microbes in complex fluid, we um, basically look at how the hydrodynamic interaction affects their distribution near surfaces and how our rheological properties of fluids like shear thinning or viscoelasticity can affect their interaction with surfaces. And um, the shear thinning itself, for example, leads to very small viscosity close to the swimmer itself. So the swimmers move very rapidly in corridors of um, low viscosity medium. And uh, with that, I'm going to summarize on the talk. So the first part of the talk I summarized by a limerick, thanks to hydrodynamic interaction, surfactant helped to increase bacteria fraction, consuming oil droplets, eating them like chocolates as it's combined to chemotaxis reaction. And the second part of the talk, I talked about mechanosensing and how the speed and mechanosensing can be suppressed by stratification and stratification suppressing dispersion of particles and enhancing their cluster formation and the mixing um, that is generated by these swimmers um, affected, uh, being affected by um, their stability in inertial regime as well as a stratified regime. And with that, I'm going to stop and uh, open the floor for questions. Um, thank you very much, Arazu. Uh, um, good tour of a lot of wonderful things uh, you have been doing. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Please unmute yourself and uh, uh, feel free to ask questions. Shankar, you have a question? Uh, yes, um, Arzu, very nice talk. Um, I had a question, how big is the length scale of those clusters compared to say as gradient of the mean concentrations? Um, you, you're referring to the first portion of talk where we have concentration in, um, for example, soluble components of the oil. Is that is that correct? No, I was thinking about the stratification oh, problem. Stratification. And, right, right. So the the length of, the length of scale of uh, cluster is a several um, particle size, whereas the cons and which would be um, on the order of um, millimeter and centimeter. The length of scale over which density changes is on the order of meters. Okay. Though I should mention that I'm studying these at the smaller scale, the computational tools I'm using basically is for resolving different length of scales. So consequently, I'm not looking at the um, uh, scale of meter. I got it. Okay. Okay. So you think there may be an opportunity where uh, they may be even bigger? Is that not clear at this point? I, I, it's not clear for me at this point, but there is opportunity that they can be bigger. I, we need to study it basically. Sure. Very nice talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Can I follow up on that question? Um, so in the real ocean context, uh, the salinity gradient, is it, uh, and the thermal gradients, are they um, large enough for stratification to affect these micro scale organisms? Yes, um, that's actually what we showed. In, like one length of scale that like comes to mind very um, immediately is that the length of scale of meter and the stratification being length, but, uh, being um, uh, being weak, but on um, the calculation that I've done is for the gradients that occurs in um, uh, in, for example, Pacific Ocean. Um, that was taken from a paper that measured um, density gradient. So for it, those numbers also occur in, in ocean, and that leads to stratification length of scale that can be on the order of few hundred micrometer or millimeter. So still the smaller organisms can be affected um, by stratification. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you think about bacteria or something that is one micron, then won't be with this mechanism, but um, there can be other mechanisms even for those smaller bacteria. For example, what you have shown um, in a study that I didn't talk about here is that um, for some smaller bacteria or algae, 
um, that are below this stratification length of scale, but they show phytoplankton, um, they show, sorry, um, bioconvection plumes because of the um, bottom heaviness. Um, so stratification, what it can do is suppress these uh, bioconvection plume formation because the bioconvection plume itself has a larger length of scale. So stratification can still suppress those um, bioconvection plumes. Ed, do you see any questions on uh, um, YouTube channel? No, I don't. Okay. Um, floor is open for other questions. Anyone wants to? Uh, uh, Jing Ran, uh, you have. Uh, Alfredo, go ahead. Yeah, Arizu, thanks a lot for the nice talk. I think that when we have thermal stratification, uh, there is an extra shear which is uh, introduced in the flow field and the extra shear can actually uh, let the microorganism lose their orientation. So somehow, is this the main mechanism or the scales are too different? I, I think one should look at both of them coupled together and the scales are not that different. Uh, so in terms of a scale of shear, the driving some patchiness because of the gradients in, in velocity field, as well as these patchiness we see in concentration uh, of uh, either salt or, or um, temperature. So I think the scales are not different and one has to look at them and couple with each other. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, otherwise, I will be asking one more question. So I will first give you guys an opportunity. Um, okay, Arizu, it's my turn again. Then sure. uh, I want to go to the first part of your uh, talk, uh, um, where you talked about trapping. Very interesting results. Uh, um, uh, and you, you, you have not just interesting results, a very uh, innovative analysis looking at uh, this uh, multipole uh, uh, aspect and making use of it. The one question I have there is, uh, is clearly the microbes are small, so Stokasian uh, uh, approximation works well. But these droplets that trap them could be uh, maybe... Uh, millimeters or hundreds of microns uh, uh, in size, and they could have inertial effects. Uh, and uh, how do you, I mean, have you taken that into account? Uh, uh, but it may be harder from the multipole expansion perspective. So how do you handle so, that? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, so for the first part of the talk um, there, um, we, yeah, we use the multiple expansion for microbes, not for the drops. But it's still the point you are making is valid in the sense that the droplet themselves, uh, if they're rising uh, or settling on the inertia effect, can change their motion. We looked at moving droplets uh, as well, but it's still neglecting um, their inertia. But the second portion of the talk that I talked about, that was numerical simulation. So there we included the inertial effect, the rising motion of the droplet, and even the pseudo turbulence that it generates. So there we, we included all those effects um, into the problem. Yeah, okay, so it's a difficult problem. But it's, it's interesting that I always thought that uh, even for finite Reynolds number, so in Euler Lagrange kind of simulations, we only apply the, the force. Uh, there's always an interest, uh, like, like force coupling method of March and Maxi includes mm -hmm. higher order terms. So mm -hmm. the systematically introducing uh, Rotlet and other things into the two-way coupling, uh, what effect does it have is something that I've been interesting. Uh, so I need to read your papers uh, on uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the trapping effects. Okay. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. Like, I've been also interested to use some of those approach. Um, uh, I haven't get a chance to look, and look at, get it, and now you're reminding me of uh, that yeah, this would be an interesting uh, direction to look at as well. I, I have another question, Arezu. Can I, Bala? Please. <laughs> yeah. So um, once this bacteria, these small bacteria trapped at the interface, uh, do you think that there might be an effect on surface tension so they might act like surfactant? I, I, I think they will be. So here on, on the experiments, actually, we see some of them also trapped at the interface, uh, though we primarily look at that their distribution away from the interface. But, um, but in, theoretically, we are, uh, we are just modeling the surfactant, not the bacteria or part colloids, them ba yeah. modeling bacteria as colloids and then including their effect, but that can well happen as well. 
Shankar, you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Balaya. Also, so my question is, if you look at this in the natural environment, I'm thinking of, uh, and I'm very naive in this, so forgive me if I'm, I'm thinking of these red algae blooms that you see in Florida and stuff like that, very large scale distribution of microbiome. Do these things occur on such large scales and what are the simulation techniques to, to model that kind of a thing? And, and does your work kind of feed into that? Uh, would that so be? the simulation techniques to, um, to look at those uh, red tides would be not to definitely like um, resolve the microbes like very last slide it. There is no way to do that. But some models similar to what I um, presented uh, um, for the consumption of methane, for example, where you model these um, microbes as convection diffusion type equation, but then you need to include all the physics that are relevant there is doable. And uh, the, the paper that I was uh, referring earlier in response to Bala's question, where we looked at bioconvection uh, plume and how they are suppressed actually was with the goal of that. So there we solve basically continuity and momentum equation, but rather than, uh, but the microbes themselves are continuum scale, um, and then include the gyrotactis effect and some of the other effects. And we see actually this, uh, what you're referring is that a stratification basically suppresses bioconvection plume leading to accumulation of microbe at the surface. So some type of uh, calculation with those um, type of analysis, which includes, uh, includes other physics that are needed um, mm -hmm. for the red tide uh, formation would be relevant. Um, so it, so it is a multi-scale problem. And my question is, does the, do the physics at the micro scale, like right at the scale that you're looking at, do they actually affect uh, things at the large scale? I suppose that's I, my... I, I believe so, yes, okay. it does. Okay. Because, um, and, and the problem also becomes more challenging because if you think about the multi-scale is not only physical multi-scale, but also biological multi-scale because the smaller organisms and driving also larger organisms and all those to scale. Uh, become relevant in that sense as well. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions to Arizu? Okay, uh, Arizu. I think uh, um, it's uh, about one hour. Um, uh, so thank you for spending uh, uh, your time and uh, going through um, the. Uh, um, many facets of the research uh, your group has been doing. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, and uh, we all will meet in two weeks time uh, with uh, yet another uh, um, spotlight seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.